Hey 4-Hers, I am here at Bright Box Farms and I am excited to share with you a little tour of the upgrade that we have since the last tour we did. Uh, we're here with Gideon and Sina who run this business and we're going to ask them all of your questions that you had but I wanted to just get a kind of outside look at what we're going to walk into. Well, welcome to Bright Box Farms for tour number two. The first time we looked at our little microgreen tent. And this time we're going to look at our Freight Farms Greenery, which is a hydroponic system inside of a 40-foot container. It's insulated with an HVAC system and all that. So we'll go take a look at that and uh, get to your questions. Awesome. This is a 40-foot container by 8 feet wide. Here we go. So we'll start here okay. at kind of the beginning. And so we have a seedling station where everything is germinated and it grows for about three weeks from little germinated babies. And then there's basically, this would be what we would consider week one in the nursery station or the seedling station. This would be growth at week two and this is growth at week three, and these are ready to transplant into the larger cultivation area, and we'll get to that in a minute. But So we germinate in these little plugs. We set them in here under the lights. This floods with nutrient. They soak it up in these plugs, and that's what feeds them, and then they just grow in here until their, their root system is, is robust enough to transplant. So that's a healthy root system wrapped around this kind of organic plug. What's the plug made of? It's a peat and a cocoa core and some other little like organic binding material, but it's just a it's just a little organic matter that gives the roots something to hold on to while they're, while they're growing. So this is what we would call the seedling station. Yeah, yeah. So this is this is the dosing panel for the seedling station. This is the dosing panel for the main cultivation area, which is back here, and I'll show you that in a minute. These are these are fertilizers, right? Part A and part B, and a pH adjustment. This is kind of a root food that we give weekly. Um, if you come over here with the camera. So this is this is the, the nutrient solution in water. And what you see here is a, re, a, a constant 24-hour recirculation line. And so what's happening is there's a little pump down in the bottom of this tank picking up water. It's the pump sends that water up this line. It comes up in the back of this front here. There's a bunch of pipe works and stuff. This pipe continues up. It comes across these sensors right here. So this is a pH sensor, a nutrient sensor, and a temperature sensor. So the fluid comes up across these sensors. It takes a reading. And as it, as it comes around here, based on what these read, if it needs more fertilizer, if it needs to adjust the pH, as this line comes around, it comes back right by all these little dosing pumps and comes out here and then it automatically feeds the nutrient with a pH and then it goes back into this tank so that this tank is always at the optimum uh, settings, right? Do all of these plants need the same amount of the nutrients? They do, okay. they do. So that makes it easier. Yeah, so they're all, they're all fed the same and basically what happens is this thing will, this thing will flood, so it's an ebb and flow, so this will flood up to a certain set point and then the pump shuts off and it drains back and then these plugs just this is bottom watering. It's just bottom watering. Yep. So that answers the question how plants get the water and nutrients. Yep. And the other part of that question from our creature was the light and the air. So it yep. looks like so the, you can hear. Yep. So the, the actual grow lights aren't on, but this is this is the LED array right here. 
And to answer one of the other questions about how many lights do we have, there's 120 of these LED arrays. Eight of them are in here. There's two, four, six, eight that grow the babies. The remainder of them are here on the big on the cultivation area. So once these have substantial roots, we transplant them from in here into these towers here that you were just looking at. And so what we do here, I'll go ahead and pull this off. These panels come off. Wow. <laughs> we set it on our work table here. And this foam has a gap in it. And there's a little cotton wicking strip. And so what we would do is we would take these plugs out of here one by one. And we have these predetermined where they go based on the crop that we're growing. So we line this thing up and drop these in place. And then once they're all in, we pick it back up. We bring it back over here. We line it up on its little hanger. And it hangs there again. Okay, so I'm going to do that again for you, as if it wasn't cool enough the first time. All right, so we're going to and then bring your camera over here, and we'll, this will this will show you how these get water. So if you look up here, that gray tube is the pipe works, and then there's these little black spouts, these little nozzles. Those are drip emitters. And they allow two gallons per hour to drip out. And those come on every 40 minutes. And then that, that nutrient-rich water goes down the middle of that foam along that wicking strip and waters the roots as they're in this panel. Huh. And then the water at the bottom goes into this trough. And the farm's on a, on a slight slope. And so everything drains back to the main tank, which is in the back wall. So it's just a circulation system. And this nutrient water does the same thing through that main dosing panel. So its settings are a little different. Just how do plants live without soil? So yeah, Cindy, you want to take that? So plants rely on the soil and the dirt for their structure, so that they have some support. And so we use the foam for the plugs, which are going to pull up more of the heat. It gives their roots something to hold on to. And then when they get their nutrients, they get through the solution rather than minerals that are normally present in regular dirt, like in your backyard. Okay. They're able to get their nutrients from that solution instead of from the dirt, which then allows them to do all their roots and pieces and stuff when they have the right light and great right air, and then they grow. And how do their roots not get rotten? I thought that this might be a good point to ask about that. Yeah, so in the seedling trough, um, part of the way that works is because of the ebb and flow, so they get wet, they have time to get some moisture saturated into the, in the little plugs, and then there's a whole lot of time where they're allowed to drain and dry out and they get good airflow. Um, airflow is one of the biggest and most important things for roots to keep them from rotting. So some plants can actually just grow in water as long as there's enough oxygen in the water so that they can breathe. Um, so if there's no oxygen, you need to make sure they have oxygen. So um, in the panels, when it drips, it waters for about six minutes, and then it turns off for, for 39 minutes or 35 minutes. So every 40 minutes, it gets another round of, of water, and that again allows them to get oxygen to the roots, lets them dry out a little bit, and then they don't start to get moisture. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. That's um, pretty cool system. <laughs> It's heavy. Yeah. It comes this way much better than it goes back. Yeah. <laughs> so we have four rows. One, two, three, four. Each row has 22 of these panels, and each panel has five rows in them. And so between the seedling station and the main cultivation area, we can have at any given time, 
just under 9,000 plants grown in this 40 foot container. Wow. About 4,400 of them can be in here getting bigger, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously there's a lot going on over here, but right. um, it's, it's about equal because as you, as you get your cycle of production going, what goes in the seedlings is coming out to cultivation when you harvest it so that you're constantly have a, a flow of product. Um, disease, so one of the 42s asked how you prevent disease, because I can imagine that that would be a problem. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's the beauty of, of indoor vertical farming like this, is right. it's a controlled environment. Yeah. We're not using well, gobs. We're not using <laughs> gobs. Do you guys just see that here? <laughs> Airflow. Yeah. Airflow, right? Yeah. Airflow, right? Yep. right? So, um, so it's tight. Yeah. Right? We don't have a lot of soil, right? We we keep our plugs isolated. We keep you know the the seeds um, are locked tight. Um, it's, you know, airflow, keeping humidity down, uh, well, keep the bugs out, you know, don't let them ever get in here. Yeah, you know? and that was another question about pollination, but you don't, these plants don't need pollination. Yeah, they do not. Yeah, right. So leafy greens don't, I mean, they will flower eventually if, you, if they go start to seed, but right. um, because we're just cultivating for the foliage, you don't have to worry about the pruning plant, which is what needs the pollination. So like if we were trying to do tomatoes or cucumbers or something like that in here, it would be very different as far as what types of plants we would choose. Um, a lot of times, even in a controlled environment or a hydroponic environment, they'll try and pick varieties that are self-pollinating, um, but then there are some that you just have to pollinate, and so there's all kinds of techniques around that. But thankfully, we don't have to worry about that in here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me about this word. <laughs> The brain behind the system. This is, this is the bookie board. Uh -huh. right? So this just keeps track of what we've seeded, what we've harvested, the dates that they were transplanted from the seedling station uh -huh. to the main cultivation. So they're they're growing in the seedling station for three weeks total, then they're in here for five weeks. Okay. You know, between four and five weeks in here, depending on the the variety and, and just how big they get and how fast they go. So this just kind of keeps track of where we're at. Um, and then some other just kind of maintenance tasks. One thing about hydroponics is um, you need to keep it pretty clean, right? Algae grows and, you know, the fertilizer along with the UV light makes things grow inside the tank and the water. It's a perfect climate. It's a perfect, you know, uh, breeding ground. So, um, Lots of cleanliness, lots of draining and cleaning and scrubbing and back, you know, and again, that helps with the pest control, right? That yeah. keeps things from growing and getting out of, out of hand. I mean, everything in here is stainless. We wipe it down. We sanitize everything. Uh, it's so pretty. But, you know, that that's the nice thing about hydroponics and then being inside is we just, we can control the environment, right? So we can, we can make it really hard for the bugs to live in here we're on top of it and we're controlling it. It's not like it's outside, you know, the wind's not blowing in here. It's not, so you know. That's one of the other questions. What temperature is it? And I want to add to that, what is the humidity set to? Yeah, so we, we because this is a, this this farm has a brain. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, we, can, we can run this farm from a computer or an app on my phone. So there's actually an app for that. <laughs> um, and so our temperatures, during the day are 70 degrees because it's primarily lettuce that we're growing. So a high of 70 and a low of 60 at night. And we have our humidity set point at about 55% humidity. And it kind of fluctuates above that, but it, it averages out at about 55% humidity. And so all those are controllable parameters. Um, once we set those, the farm takes over and it does its thing. So between the nutrient delivery system, the heating and ventilation, the lights, all that, it all works together to just create a perfect environment to grow whatever the product is that you're desiring to grow. So these other, these are all just lights right here? Yeah, so I wanted to show you. So um, we can go ahead and take a look at this uh, 
So this is a CO2 delivery system. As you go by, you'll, you'll kind of pick up on that. And so it, um, when the lights are on during the day, when the plants, the day cycle for the plants, we supplement some, some CO2 to optimize their growth and their, their photosynthesis. Um, but yes, yeah, so this is, these are the big lights for the grow area. So, and there's four sets of these that run the length of each outer wall. And then there is this middle rack is double-sided light arrays. And, and it's and those little things of light? Those are the diodes, yep, yep. So there's 112 panels, and I, am, I do not yeah. know how many diodes <laughs> are on there, but it's really bright. When these are all on, it's uh, you have to wear very dark sunglasses. <laughs> so we don't do a lot of work in here when those lights are on. Um, just, just how long do they stay on? You might have said that already. Yeah, 18 hours. Six hours off, 18 hours on. So, so this is this here is our row of what we call our cut and come again um, varieties. And I'll, I'll let Sina talk to these because she's in here a lot trimming and, and pulling off. But this is a lot of our Asian greens and our herbs. So Yeah, so we've got um, Pak Choi. This is rosy, red rosy. It's um, really fun. I love it in salad. Um, the leaves are nice. They kind of have a, the texture of spinach. All of the Asian greens are kind of a spinachy texture. Um, so they hold up really well in salads. They're also great if you want to throw them in soup or whatever else. And then um, those we usually let get fairly big. These are actually a little overgrown. I need to trim them. But then I'll come in and, and trim the lower leaves off, mm -hmm. give them some more air, and then those will get thrown in some of our salad mixes and our bags. Um, so you just cut the outer leaves yep. and leave, and the rest and will just keep growing. Keep and then when we're ready to transplant new, we start them, we'll just take them all out. Take a look at this right here and you'll kind of see, it, it, they, they kind of end up taking on kind of a, like a little palm tree look. Yeah. These not as much, but you'll see some varieties that, so you cut the outer and then the inner just kind of picks up. So then this is arugula. How long will it, it let you do that? Uh, well, it depends. So like the arugula, I can usually get three trims out of before it really starts to go. So like you see, like these are starting to flower. Right. And even though they've started to flower, I can cut them, trim off the leaves. You can eat the leaves. You can actually eat the flowers. Mm -hmm. um, it's an herb, which a lot of people don't realize that it is. Very spicy. This particular arugula, when the leaves first come out, they're a lot milder. And then subsequent winter means get way spicier. So the older the plant, the spicier it is. Um, and so then when they, like, so like these guys, these ones will probably be taken out pretty soon. And there's not a lot of extra stuff coming off of them. So then it's like, okay, time to recycle them. Yeah. Put new stuff in. Um, the Mizuna and then this is uh, Scarlet Frills um, Mustard. It just kind of takes it over. <laughs> <laughs> and so this I'm constantly coming in and trimming. Um, I could probably get five or six times out of this, but three is kind of what we're going for. Uh -huh. um, and, and as we walk down, so this was stuff I trimmed this last week. This is stuff I'll be trimming this week. This is more arugula. Um, so this is kind of like the first grow of it. Some of the leaves get kind of a funky discoloration on them, so those get taken out. Mm -hmm. Usually the stuff we eat. You have chickens that you feed them to? Uh, well, we don't, <laughs> yeah. but um, we do are, we're happy to give away all of our trimming. So if anyone wants trimming, let nice. us know. Yeah, sometimes we take them down to the mission and they only feed them to goats. And the chickens down there. And so then we have kale, same thing. You just for these, you just trim the small bottom leaves. Um, and I usually wait until they get to be about, you know, the size before I'll cut them. Uh, just because if they're too small, you do a lot of, spend a lot of time trimming. Yeah. So finding that happy medium where they taste good, but they're not out of control. And then some of them I let get bigger, and then those will be just a bigger tail bunch versus right. like a baby mix. Um, and then so we have more choy. He's definitely need so to get happy. <laughs> I know, it's ridiculous. And that's why I gotta trim those big leaves to see how yeah. they start to take over. Kind of my herbs and then there's some kale thrown in, but I've got <laughs> parsley, curly parsley, I've got really amazing sage growing. The winter time is amazing. And then buried buried in here, I've got some rosemary, I've got some nice rosemary up top. Um, and then I've got Cilantro, and then I've got some dill. This is eventually this is gonna come out here pretty soon, and I'll get probably cilantro here, dill. What about basil? 
basil I grow inside. Oh, okay. So you were talking about climate before and can everything grow that we have growing in the tropics all have the same nutrients. Well, right. because it's a controlled environment and we only have one environment, everything that grows in here has to be somewhat compatible. And while you can grow basil in these farms, basil likes it a little bit warmer and they have different nutrient requirements and pH okay. than most of our leafy greens. And so for me, I can consistently grow it in my microgreens farm, so I've just been doing it there and I've been doing things that I know will be better out here together. I just asked, it's my favorite. Yeah, <laughs> well, and basil is one of those, um, so basil doesn't like it below like 55, and the farm in here, when the lights are off, gets cold. So it's very often it'll drop to 55 before things come back on. And so I don't, I don't know that it would like it very well. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but things like our um, parsley leaf I transplanted, I think a week and a half ago, and they're already yeah looking super happy. So um, cool. And then the rest of our farm is all all lettuce varieties. I love the purple. I know I do too. Well, what are you doing? I am <laughs> dropping lettuce seeds. It's today is our our seedling day, so I'm taking these little pelleted lettuce seeds, and one by one, I'm dropping them in these holes. And there's each tray has 288, and so those will turn into those, right. which turn into those, which turn into these. You want to look at some lettuce? And so these you'll just pull all at once, you don't trim? Yeah, so you can, just like the rest of the stuff, you can actually do lettuce and trim the lettuce and let it grow back. We haven't experimented with that yet. It's not a mostly thing that's not curious about. Um, so typically we can go ahead. Yeah. And do you, I know you sell like the bags of the other stuff, do you sell whole heads of lettuce? We haven't yet. Okay, I haven't um, seen it, but no. Yeah, we, I mean, it's one of those that if somebody wanted it that way, we would certainly accommodate them. Yeah. But most of what folks want right now is they just want a bag of, of mixed salad. Yeah. They can pour it out and ready to go. Yeah. So, yeah, we're not doing whole heads yet, but we certainly can, and we can actually do live heads too. To where if we were to just pop that plug out, mm -hmm. put it in a little water, you could keep this on the counter in sunlight, and it would sit there and do its thing for. Oh, that sounds like a cool 4-H project. Well, <laughs> yeah. So these are all the the variations of lettuce that we're growing. These are a few weeks out from harvesting. Again, we, we harvest every week, and so we're we're doing five week lettuce, meaning they're in the panels for five weeks. So we we just divide our total number of panels by five weeks. That gives you a weekly harvest, and then we just roll through like that. So um, we space these, you know, to where you know once these are about ready to go, they'll all be touching. So you know they they're getting adequate airflow. Because again, if they were all bunched up, things, bugs, you know, moisture, you know, so you want to keep everything nice and dry and, and fresh. So, but this is. So these are different times. They, yeah. Yep, okay. Yeah. And part of that is we want to try and figure out what grows really well in here. Yeah. You know, what do we like the flavor of? Right. Because how long have you had this? November, yeah, we took delivery at the end of November, and then, uh, you know, we had it plugged in, powered on, and, and turned the lights on. By I think we harvested our first crops at the end of December. Yeah, it was fast. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, so we're, 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 you know, we're three or four months into it now. Uh -huh. So, um, but yeah, this is, you know, there's Salanovas, and then there's some Romaines, and more Romaines. And, they and, look happy, that's for sure. Yeah, they they do all right. And again, if you <laughs> we all do. Yeah. Well, that's the thing, right? When you're growing living plants, mm -hmm. they're all you know part of part of this whole process of farming. Even though there's so much that's automated, you still have to come in and look at everything. And you know, something might come off. You've got to figure out what it is, and you know, it might sometimes it might just be the plant. You never know. Mm -hmm. So getting to know your plants and what they typically do, and then 
know, and occasionally, you know, some things just, whether it's, you know, the roots weren't established enough, or you, you kind of have to be selective before you put them in here, because you do shock them, and sometimes they just don't bounce back quite as, as well as others. I mean, you know, I think, I mean, this, this thing is here, and then look at this one, you know? Right. And, and this, again, this has two more weeks to go, and the, the last week, between the four week and the five week mark, they really, really, really like kind of open up. Uh -huh. yeah. So that that last week is, is significant. But I mean, these are some beautiful romaine heads. You know, and then I mean, this is a red oak leaf. We love, we absolutely love these. Um, you know, it's kind of a baby romaine, but it's just. It's a beautiful lettuce. Um, I think one that will be interesting to answer, which is how did it get here to Kodiak? <laughs> and do you want to explain about the crane and everything? <laughs> sure. It took them, what, eight months to build it? Um, it was right around the same time COVID was happening, you know what I mean? So there were some supply chain issues for them coming out of China, you know, a lot of the, the components and whatnot. They were just delayed. So um, they made up for it by bringing on more crews. but. So it was built in Boston, and then we trucked it all the way to Seattle. And then it hung around the yard there, the shipyard there for a little while, and then we put it on barge. And uh, <laughs> Samson brought it up for us, and then uh, Samson delivered it here at the house. We had Highmark Marine come over with their link belt, their 85 ton, took up the whole road, <laughs> and picked it up and swung it around, and we got it kind of set down and braced and shimmed and again everything's kind of leveled perfectly so all of this extra nutrient flows to the back of the farm to be sent back up to the front again and it, it, it's a, just like the airflow the water flow everything's in this circular pattern it's, tell, a, it's a lot of fun tell everybody where they can get the microgreens if they want to eat some yeah so yeah all of all of bright box farms products uh you can find them at cost savers in the cooler um over by kind of the what's over there there's the salsas and the you know back by the produce there's a cooler that, that al was kind enough to uh dedicate just for us um cactus flats sells some product um you, uh, yeah the, our website brightboxfarms.com you can order online you can pick up here at the house we can deliver um you know you'll see it on your your sandwiches out at java flats um, Harborside, Dianic Million Recipes is using it, um, but if you just want a bag to go, you know, you can either pick it up here at the house, at the farm, or swing by cost savers and grab some out of the cooler. We awesome. keep it stocked every other day if we go in and reload the cooler. Yeah. People are finding it. Yeah, I noticed I, that it increased from just a smaller yeah. to like a big one. <laughs> yeah, more. we've got to go by there regularly. and. And uh, they're good about sending us messages. Uh, it's gone. Yeah. You know, so we run by and load it back up, and then we'll usually do a Instagram and Facebook post saying, "Hey, restocked." You know. So. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thanks for taking us on the tour. Anytime. Maybe later in the future we can have a in-person tour. That would be great. <laughs> I mean, we're we're definitely there. Yeah. You know, to where a, a small handful of folks can come by and get even some hands-on kind of experience with, with I could always use help dropping. Yeah. <laughs> All right, you heard him. All right. All right, thanks guys. You bet.